This is Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. Glad you could join me on yet another brand new edition this year of New Life Program. And hopefully, you will enjoy my company just as I hope to enjoy yours. I'm your host, Tileno Diambo. Most of us, especially in the life today, are living with damaged hearts in one way or the other. Maureen Opondo will be joining us shortly to give some more updates on living with the damaged heart during the health segment. Later on in the show, Pastor Kigundu Ndwiga will also be coming in with a topic known as Give Me the Bible. Stay tuned for this and much more items coming your way. For now, let us listen to some sweet melodious tune from Faith for Today Quartet entitled In the Garden. I come to the garden alone While the dew is still on the roses And the voice I hear falling on my ear The Son of God discloses Listener, I hope that you're still enjoying the show. Let us now invite Marino Pondo to shed some more light on living with a damaged heart. Keep it the voice of hope. Hello, listener. Today we are going to talk about living with a damaged heart. So your doctor has just told you that you have a damaged heart and you're feeling a bit uneasy, wondering what the future may hold for you. 
This is perfectly natural, for any normal person will be a little concerned to learn that he has something wrong with his heart. But it doesn't mean you are going to die from a heart attack, not by any means. Many people who have heart disease manage to live to a ripe old age and never know that they've had anything wrong with their heart at all. There are many things worse than having to live with a slightly damaged heart. Yes, it's true that thousands of people die of heart disease every year. The number is probably greater today than at any other time in history. But there is a reason for this. Fifty years ago, heart diseases was a long way down in the list of the most dangerous diseases. Back in those days, tuberculosis held the top place as the greatest killer of humanity. Pneumonia and other serious infections also carried a vast number of people every year, but not so today. What's brought about this remarkable change? What are deaths from heart disease so much more common today? Because most of the serious infections have now been largely under control. Even tuberculosis is responding in a remarkable way to the newer forms of treatment. And because of this, many more people are living longer and reaching the time when heart disease takes its toll. Let me illustrate what I mean. Back in the days when I was a medical student, I was assigned to a large city hospital. It was thrilling to see so many doctors and nurses at work helping all those sick patients back to health. But there were some tragic moments even in that great center of healing. Among the saddest sites in the famous hospital were the large pneumonia wards. Almost any time that you might enter one of these wards, you would see long rows of beds, and in each bed there would be a patient propped up in pillows gasping for breath. There just never seemed to be enough oxygen to go around. It was a tragic sight. Then the miracle happened. Several years we'd had whispers of a wonderful new medicine. It had a long name that it now almost forgotten, sulfalamide. There have been many improvements in the sulfur drugs since those days. The first tablets were very expensive and they were less effective than the newer antibiotics in common use today. But the effect on those pneumonia was truly dramatic. Within a few weeks, those beds were strangely empty. Those new tablets were marvelous. The dangerous pneumococcus germs had met their master at last. Before the advent of sulfamanide, nearly one-third of those pneumonia patients died. Now they all have a chance to live. Since those days, many newer and more powerful antibiotics have been produced. Another very important factor in the control of serious infection diseases is the improvement in social condition. For example, sanitation, better housing, dietary habits. For example, sanitation, better housing and dietary habits. As a result, millions of people who in the past will probably have died from infections are now living and well. And because so many people are living so much longer, they are now subjected to degenerative that tend to come in a later life. This includes diseases of the liver, kidney, nerves, and heart. These conditions are often due to hardening of arteries. Any of the different organs may be involved that the most frequent is often the heart. For this reason, heart disease is of primary concern to all of us and even more so to those who may have some real heart trouble. The human heart has great reserve of power and energy. It can stand an enormous amount of strain and disability without breaking down, provided it's treated well. But a heart that is already partly damaged may be slowly destroyed by poor habits of living in spite of all the wonderful medicine available today. There are none that can equal good, wholesome living in preserving the heart and the whole body in health. This is particularly true in the cases of those whose hearts may have been damaged by diseases. Heart disease occur in several different forms. A few babies are born with defective hearts, but such cases are rather rare. Children and young people may develop rheumatic heart disease through infections of the nose and throat. In older people, heart disease is more likely to occur from high blood pressure and from hardening of the arteries. But a verdict of heart disease doesn't mean that a person is doomed to sudden death. This is the exemption rather than the rule. 
Thousands of people whose hearts have been damaged by disease are still able to carry on their work and live happily for many years. Many of these people can look forward to making a fairly good recovery provided they know how to take care of themselves. In the middle life heart disease is often associated with high blood pressure. We are still not too sure what actually makes the blood pressure go up. But if that pressure continues to remain high, we can see its deadly effect in the heart and in the blood vessels and indeed throughout the whole body. Because of high blood pressure or perhaps for some as yet unknown reasons, the walls of the smaller blood vessels in many parts of the body may become scarred and thickened. This condition is known as arterial sclerosis or hardening of the arteries. When this happens, it may be difficult to bring the blood pressure down and keep it down to a safe level. This is because the wall of the smaller blood vessels are no longer flexible and elastic as they once were. They have become hard. This tends to reduce the flow of blood through the various organs. The body may then respond by raising the blood pressure and keeping it high so that the vital centers of the brain will be constantly supplied with blood. This extra blood pressure then causes more wear and tear on the blood vessels. Their walls become thickened and irregular and they are no longer able to carry their normal amount of blood. The same thing might happen to the water supply in your home. Imagine the water pipes becoming partially clogged with rust. Those pipes would then carry less water and the rate of flow would be slowed down by the rust in the walls of the pipes. In the same manner, the walls of the blood vessels may become irregular. They are no longer smooth and elastic. This tends to slow down the blood stream, especially in the smaller vessels and dangerous clots may begin to form. If the vessels that supply the wall of the heart with the blood should become hardened and narrow, the person may begin to feel sharp pains in his chest when he walks too fast or works too hard or perhaps when he worries too much. Those sharp pains in the chest are very likely to occur when a person is under some intense emotional strain. Any exertion, however, may bring on these pains. When this happens, it usually means that the little rusty pipes in the walls of the hearts are no longer able to carry their normal amount of blood to supply the heart muscles itself with energy. These sharp pains must be carefully distinguished from the dull prolonged aching in the heart that may follow some bad news or some severe disappointments. In such cases, there is usually nothing wrong with the heart itself, but the sharp pains that come on after some extra effort are usually nature's signal that the individual must relax and rest. These pains are probably due to the presence of certain very irritating chemicals and waste material that are not being carried away by the bloodstream quickly enough. You can produce the same effect by merely twisting a tight rubber band around the base of your finger. The band will temporarily stop the flow of blood through your finger and as a result the waste product will not be removed as promptly as they should be. After time, your finger will become blue and painful and you will be forced to release that rubber band. In the same way, a person who suffers from heart pains will be forced to rest and wait until the bloodstream can remove these irritating substances. It may take a few seconds or perhaps several minutes before such a person can go on his way again. This is nature's warning signal that that person must not take too many liberties. He must take the pressure of his heart by resting for a short time. If he'll do this, he usually has little to fear. It simply means that the blood vessels are no longer carrying their normal load. They may have been damaged from infection or from a poor diet or perhaps from bad habits of living. But whatever the cause of the effect is usually the same. Sir William also described this very well when he remarked that a man is as old as his arteries. A pain in the heart is often nature's way of letting us know that there is a time to slow down and take things a bit easier. Perhaps you are worrying too much or not getting enough sleep, but this doesn't mean that you should become over anxious or discouraged. You can get along fairly well when you know how to live within the limits of your strength. For instance, it may be very unwise for you to run for a train or a bus. Your doctor will advise you as to whether you should climb stairs and also how many hours a day you should work. He'll probably tell you that you must not hurry or allow yourself to be angry. This always puts an extra burden on the heart. 
You may not be able to play 18 holes of gold anymore and a hard game of tennis may be entirely out of the question for you in future. Maybe you'll have to move into a one-story building and avoid climbing hills and stairs. But in any case, the less you worry about yourself and your future, the better you'll be. Your diet is very important. If you have high blood pressure, you may need to cut down on the amount of salt you are using. It's well for you to plan your meal so that you will not have too many mixtures in your food. You should avoid all those things that cause gas in your stomach. It's very wise for you to eat regularly and never too much at any one meal. If you are overweight, ask your doctor for a sensible reducing diet which you can follow until you get down to your ideal weight. It's certainly wise for you to give up smoking for tobacco in any form is bad for people with heart disease. By all means, place yourself under the care of a well-trained physician. It's well for you to avoid all bustle and hurry, especially when these are brought on by overwork. Watch carefully against colds and influenza, for the slightest fever will always put on extra burden upon the heart. Remember that most people with heart disease manage to live fairly normal lives, but they must live at a slower pace. Then keep your courage high. Don't let your faith fall. Keep yourself cheerful and always look on the brighter side. In spite of your disability, commit yourself to God every day and determine to live within your heart's limitation. If you will do this, your chances of a happy and comfortable life are very good indeed. Thank you for keeping it Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope. We'll be so much delighted to receive your views, comments, and suggestions. Send them to the producer, Adventist World Radio, P.O. Box, 42276 code 00100 Nairobi, Kenya or on our email address which is awrnairobi at eku.adventist.org Here's some sweet melodious tune from the Faith for Today Quartet entitled For a Thousand Tongues. Stay tuned. Oh, for a thousand tongues to sing by great Redeemer's praise The glories of my God and King The glories of my God and King The triumphs of His grace The triumphs of Jesus, the name that charms our fears, that bids our sorrow cease. Tis music in the sea. You are tuned to Adventist World Radio, the voice of hope, and I'm your presenter, Tileno Diambo. Pastor Kigundu always has some interesting topics to share with us. Let us now give him all the attention as he ministers and to us on the message, Give Me the Bible. Keep it the voice of hope. Dear listener, I want to welcome you today so that we can look at the words of Jesus, and the title of our talk today is Give Me the Bible. I want us to read from Matthew 7, verse 24 to 27, to set the foundation of this talk. Jesus says, Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, Yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on the sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Jane had been coming to my wife and I for counseling of our marriage 
that was breaking into pieces. After many sessions, we were convinced that Jane's greatest need was that of the Lord in her life because we were convinced if there was the Lord in her heart, she would be given the strength to cope with the challenges of our marriage. We discussed with her about the necessity of surrendering our life to the Lord, and we shared with her the difference the Lord would bring in our life and marriage. Well, one evening, Jane came over to our house with a radiant face to share the news of God's greatest miracle in our life, the conversion experience. Naturally, we are thrilled, and we really praise the Lord for that miracle. However, some days later, my wife was shocked when she visited Jane and found her drunk after partying with her friends. What surprised my wife even more was when Jane used a common Christian salutation, praise the Lord as a greeting. My wife came home muttering, what a new brand of Christianity. There is a new brand of Christianity that has come into the market. This is a brand of Christianity that says, praise the Lord and I am saved, but the life is not changed. This is a brand of Christianity that says, Jesus paid it all and therefore I am free to do anything I want. In other words, it is a lip service kind of Christianity. In this new brand of Christianity, we have what we call a one-day Christian and not a seven-day Christian. This brand of Christianity demands its adherents to look pious on the worship day only and then do as one likes during the other days of the week. Indeed, how many of us claim to be Christians we say praise the Lord and are still involved in shady, underhand and unethical business deals and practices? How many of us declare that we love Jesus wholeheartedly and still continue harassing our families like the devil would in our homes? How many of us come to church and look like angels from the throne of God, but on going home behave like those possessed with a spirit from the bottomless pit? Yes, how many of us are active in church, singing, preaching, teaching, going for outreach, and are actively involved in other activities of the church, and yet are involved in sexual immoralities? Dear listener, how many of us claim to love the brethren, yet we are tribalists, nationalists, racists, and other isms of the highest order? Somehow the love of God has not really gripped our hearts. How many of us declare that we are waiting for the Lord, yet listen to the music of the world, dress like the world, talk like the world, and gossip like the world? In fact, other than our profession, there is nothing that sets us apart from the philosophy, the mindset, and the practices of the world. Now, well, Jesus warned against this brand of Christianity in Matthew 7, verse 15 to 20. In this passage, Jesus warned against the false brethren. He declared that they would have an apron Christianity, a Christianity of convenience where the Christianity is just an external show and not an inner reality. Jesus warned that we must not be impressed too much by what one processes, but look at the fruits in the life of such a person, because we can only know a person by the fruits he bears. Jesus concluded that warning in verse 19 by showing the fate of all who follow this brand of Christianity. He said, Every tree that does not bear good fruit is cut down and thrown into the fire. There is nothing as fatal as giving lip service to the Lord, but not allowing His word to rule and transform the life. Dear listener, I want to ask you, what kind of fruit do you bear? Remember, there is an invisible axe waiting to cut down every tree that does not bear fruit. That tree will then be cast into the hellfire. What a dreadful end. In Matthew 7, verse 21 to 23, Jesus wants to forcefully drive his point home, and so he uses another approach. He declares that not everyone who calls him Lord, Lord, will enter the kingdom of heaven. Now, this is getting serious. We better listen to what Jesus is saying because our eternal destiny hinges on what he is saying. Jesus is saying, there are many who profess to believe in him, but they will miss heaven. 
He is not saying that everybody who declares he or she is a Christian and that the Lord is very dear to them will inherit the kingdom of God. According to Jesus, there is only one condition, obedience to the whole will of our Father who is in heaven. Therefore, dear listener, we may theologize and philosophize, but the bottom line crucial question is this, are we doing the will of our Father who is in heaven? Obedience is the key factor here. Beloved, have we obeyed all that the Lord has revealed to us? It is important to note at this point that those who will inherit the kingdom of God do not obey in order to be saved, but they obey because they have been saved. In other words, we can judge the reality of a person's salvation by the way that person relates to the issues of obedience. Jesus then rubs it in, in verse 22 and 23 declares, Many will say to me on that day, Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name, and in your name drive out demons and perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you, away from me, you evildoers. The thing that really scares me is to imagine that I can be lost after all I have been doing for the Lord and my deep involvement in the activities of the church. It seems to me that Jesus is saying that being members of the church, serving as officers in the church, singing in the choir, teaching the lesson, conducting Bible studies, preaching with dynamism and eloquence, being involved in evangelism, being zealous for the advancement of the church, performing miracles which are meant to prove that we possess some power and other rounds of Christian activities we get involved in will not guarantee us a place in the kingdom. What a rude shock it will be for most of us on that day if we miss the kingdom of God despite of all we have done for God. It is incomprehensible to imagine that Jesus will bar some of us from entering his kingdom, referring to us imagine as evildoers, while in our honest opinion we have spent our entire lives working for him. What a tragedy. According to Jesus, there is only one way to enter the kingdom and to inherit life. It is to be guided by only one agenda in life, doing the will of our Father who is in heaven. It is not the nobility of the things that we get involved in that matters, but what we do with the simple words of God. Do we obey them or are we disobedient? On this simple question, dear listener, lies our destiny. Jesus showed the importance of obedience when he shared the parable of the wise and foolish builders and how destiny hinges on the type of foundation laid for the Christian life. The quality of the house depends on the foundation. Consequently, the very fabric of the Christian life is determined on one's willingness to obey. What we do with the revealed word of God will determine our destiny. So the question I want to ask you, what kind of foundation are you building, dear listener? Dear listener, I ask you as we conclude the presentation for today, what materials have you used to build the foundation of your life? I hope that you have been blessed through the songs and the teachings you've heard from different speakers. Unfortunately, we have come to the end of our program this day. Feel free to send us your views comments and suggestions by writing to the producer Adventist World Radio PO Box 42276 code 00100 Nairobi Kenya or on our email address which is awr nairobi at eku.adventist.org I have been your presenter Tileno Diambo be blessed I come to the garden alone.